Would it matter if Jesus was just a good teacher and unfortunately he died? Would that change anything about Christianity? The Apostle Paul seems to think so, and we should too. Here's why. We've seen throughout Paul's epistle to the Galatians that he starts off with, with a, a great deal of frustration and anger. We're going to see that frustration come out in this section too that we're looking at now in Galatians chapter 5. I, I want to introduce two really important words to you that have to do actually with the Greek language. In English, we don't really have what's called case in our language. Hmm. Let me explain. In the Greek language, it's a really sophisticated language. In fact, we saw in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 that it said at just the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. The point is just at the right time. There's a lot of things that we didn't talk about when we looked at that section in that verse in Galatians chapter 4. It was just the right time. It was just the right time when there was a language that was the universal trade language. It's, it was known as Koine Greek. Not quite the same as the modern Greek, just in the same way that English wasn't the same in the 1600s as it is now. But here we have this language, this Greek language, that gave so much information in the way the words were formed, particularly the verbs, the doing, the action words, the stative things, I am, I was, I will be, those kind of things. One of the, the, the things that the Greek language could do is it could put a, a, a verb, a doing word, into, or a, just a word really, into what's called the indicative. That means it's just a statement. It's just telling you. It's a statement of fact. The other thing is it, it could put it in the imperative. An imperative means, therefore, you must do this. In fact, if we looked at all of Paul's epistles, pretty much all of his church epistles at least, they all have to these two components to the entire epistle. The indicative, that is statements of fact, followed by imperatives, usually headed up by the word in English, therefore. In other words, the Apostle Paul will say things and then tell you why and the, the, the why it matters, what you should now do. In this section, as we're coming up the home stretch and with all of Paul's epistles, they tend to focus more on the imperative, the, the therefore, this is what you must do with this knowledge. And so we're going to see here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul is going to more or less say something along the lines of this. If you are reliant on keeping the Torah, the law of Moses, by you men being circumcised and you women keeping the head covering rules and the fashion rules and all of the ceremonial rules and rituals and observance days, then you are saying Christ's death was absolutely meaningless. The entire epistle of Galatians is all about coming into a right relationship with God. That's a major part of it. And the major theme that Paul uses to talk about this is the theme of freedom. And so there's something else going on here too. And it's when you are set free, you have been redeemed. But Paul has said in the opening verses of chapter 4 that you have been adopted. That means something quite profound. And it's this. If you have been adopted by God, man, you are a son of God. Woman, you are a daughter of God. The profundity here, the profoundness of this is in a local church is this. That means the person who comes to church to worship with you is either your brother or your sister because you now have, you now have the same father, Father God in heaven. 
And so what that means is it's not about your ethnicity. It's not even about how you think you should do religion. It's about whether you've been made right with God and that you are now a part of the new family. God does not have two families as such. The Jews thought God had them as his prized possession, his family, and Gentiles were excluded. In order to come into God's family, the thinking was that Gentiles had to join God's family first, the Jews. And that way they qualified to have whatever Christ was offering, as long as they were already a part of the family. But Paul is saying, you got it wrong. These false teachers who have told you this have completely got this wrong. God has got a new family, not based on becoming a Jew, either religiously or ethnically, but by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He's making a new people. In Paul's later epistle to the Ephesians, he will make this point. Uh, the two epistles that sort of about, talk about both ends of this, the Ephesians talking about the body of Christ and Colossians talking about the head of Christ, complement each other to talk about the new family that God has made called the church. And so with that in mind, we pick it up here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. And reading from the English Standard Version, it says this, For freedom, Christ has set you free. There's the indicative. Listen to the imperative, the therefore. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. That is a slavery to the rules, the regulations, the observance days, all of the things that you had to do, particularly Paul is going to pick up on circumcision. So let's just pause to consider this for a moment because this circumcision rite that men went through did more than just uh, uh, some, was more than something religious. It was about belonging. It was about being identified as part of God's people. This is what it was about. And so now Paul is going to say, okay, so let, let me get this right. You think that being circumcised by a man uh, removing a piece of skin covering, flesh covering over the end of his genitals is going to make you right with God? Listen to the very strong language Paul uses here. But it's really important to understand this was so ingrained in Jewish men that this is what you had to do. That for the Judaizers, the ones who want the Gentiles, such as the Galatians, to become Jews first, then you can be made right with God. For them, it was unthinkable that there was any other way. But Paul is making it really clear they've got it wrong because it's not about keeping the Torah laws. So with that in mind, we read on, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. In other words, if you're saying you can be made right with God by having a part of your flesh cut off from your body, then Jesus died for no point. There is no purpose to Christ's death. That's pretty strong language. It should also sound a warning to those who today think Christ's death was a sad, unfortunate event that really could have been avoided. Ah, man. So I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. And Paul has already made the point. No one can keep the whole law. We just can't do it. We have a sin nature without Christ redeeming us that drags us back into breaking the law of God. And Paul said, essentially, in all of his efforts before he met Christ, he couldn't keep it. You are severed 
from Christ, he says. So when talking about cutting, he's now saying you're cut off from Christ. If you believe that cutting your flesh is what will make you right with God, you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. So let's just consider that statement because you hear people say, oh, they fell from grace. And what they, they mean is they fell into sin. But to fall from grace, Paul says, in the flow of thought here, is not to fall into sin. It's to fall into legalism. Now, again, legalism is not, the, is not merely the keeping of laws. That's not legalism. Legalism is when you trust that because you are keep, trying to keep those laws, you will be made right with God. You will find that God will offer you eternal life, a new resurrected body in the new heaven and earth. But Paul is saying to fall from grace, understanding that God does not expect you to keep the laws in order to earn his forgiveness and approval and adoption and eternal life. Paul's saying he's offering it to you freely. Christ has paid the price. He's done all the work for you. You now have to turn to him in trust and let the Holy Spirit begin to transform your life. That's, that's what he's saying. To fall away from that, that's called grace, is to fall from grace. It's to go into legalism, trusting your own efforts. That's what Paul means here by falling away from grace. For, verse 5, for through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Now, this is another one of the themes that runs right through Paul's epistle to the Galatians. It's not just about trusting Christ. It's what happens by the Holy Spirit. When we do that, something transacts in our soul. The Holy Spirit begins to transform us from the inside out. And Paul is saying it's through the Spirit, by faith, because we have trusted. And so we see here, verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And there will be this connection between trusting God, trusting Christ, and then the outworking of that is love. Here's the indicative. We put our trust and faith in Christ and God fills us with his love. And so this, is, this will be expanded as Paul goes through the remainder of this epistle. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So here Paul is saying, just, you know, just the time... A small bit of compromise will lead you to compromise in unimaginable ways. It's like saying, if, if we're, you know, imagine NASA sending a, a rocket ship to the moon and, and, and the, the astronauts report, well, we're one degree off. And NASA says, oh, one degree. One degree here is 100,000 miles off target by the time you get to the moon. One degree, one little compromise, one little bit of leaven in the loaf will penetrate the whole thing. And that word leaven is referred to in the New Testament, especially in Paul's writings, as moral corruption. Things that cause you to break God's heart. Little compromises. And so Paul is saying, verse 10, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, we remember we've seen that the accusers of Paul were saying, oh yeah, sure, he preaches you don't have to be circumcised to you Gentiles. But then he goes and talks to a Jewish audience and he says, yeah, you should be. And Paul says, I don't do that. My gospel is not changed to whoever my audience is, the gospel is the same. Christ has died for the ungodly. He now offers forgiveness to the ungodly, to all those who will turn to him in repentance, confession of their guilt, their sin, 
and seek him for forgiveness. He offers it to them freely. And that might be you. It was me and I still seek his forgiveness every time I fail. The Bible encourages me to do that. And I want to encourage you to do that as well. So here we have Paul saying, if that was me, if that was me preaching a gospel for Jews and a gospel for Gentiles, then why is it that the, that the Jews persecute me for not upholding the need to be circumcised? This is his argument. Why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. So Paul is saying, if, if you're going to say, let's be circumcised, let's cut a little bit of flesh off our genitalia, circumcision, and you're, you're saying that that's going to get the job done as far as being made right with God, then the cross of Christ was pointless. There was, you don't get it. You don't get what Christ actually did when he died on the cross. Now listen to this. If cutting a little bit of flesh off made you righteous, you might as well go the whole hog and completely emasculate yourself, the Apostle Paul says, because maybe that'll make you even more holy. You can hear the sarcasm in this as he says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Verse 13, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Brothers, here's that word that brings softness. It brings a fatherly tone to what Paul is saying because he really does care for them and he's telling them the truth. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So notice this. When you turn to Christ without depending on what you do, you are being filled with the love of God so that you can serve others and show them God's love by how you serve them. So here we have the imperative. The gospel that I'm preaching to you transforms you from the inside out. It fills you with God's love. It causes you to have love for others. And so we see Paul saying, this is, this is what you're to do. You are to follow this through where he says, don't use your opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. What's that one word? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. See, here we have Paul's imperatives. They, we've seen even in this section, they start off with do this, don't do this. Both of them, do this, don't do this, require action. They rec it is an imperative. This is what you, it is imperative that you do this. Do this, don't do this. Love one another. Don't destroy one another. Serve one another. Don't backbite and tear others down by what you say and do. This, Paul says, is how you love. And love is the greatest demonstration, evidence and fruit that the Holy Spirit has transformed you from the inside out. And this makes you an obvious member of God's family. And Paul says, if you Galatians go back to rejecting that message, then you're really saying Christ died for no good reason. And that is blasphemy. So I hope that we today can see how this applies to us today, This even this section now. So let's think just about the imperatives here. We've looked at this section. We are being encouraged to do right to do not let our grace that we have received from God be an opportunity to indulge our flesh. This means that the believer doesn't see God's commands as a burden, as the Apostle John would later write. We see the commands of God as our utter privilege and delight to keep. And we are better enabled to keep those commands. Remember, Paul says there's only one, love one another. And there's a thing that you should do and there are things you shouldn't do in order to do that. 
And so when the Spirit of God comes into you, opens your eyes, causes you to see your need for a saviour, causes you to realise that saviour is Jesus and causes you to realise you only have one option here. There is only one option on the table that God is offering. It's not pick your own religion. Paul has already said these other religions, they are essentially the worship of demons. But God has provided one means of being made right with him and that's through his son and through the cross of his son, Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've been trying in your own efforts. Perhaps you are suffering from condemnation because you've tried and tried and tried to please God, but you just haven't been able to make it. Welcome to the club. Here we have God's offer of grace. You, all you have to do is put your trust, your faith in Christ and seek God and receive his forgiveness and when you do that you open up your heart to the Holy Spirit who begins to transform you as the old shampoo ad used to say here in Australia it won't happen overnight but it will happen you will find day by day the Holy Spirit will transform you so let's pray Father I pray now for all those who've joined with me as we've dug a little bit deeper into Paul's epistle to the Galatians I pray, Father, that you speak to them, especially those in Wales, the Meadows family. I pray, Father, for those who have joined with me from uh, Oregon. Bless them. I thank you, Father, for those who are joining with me in the different states of Australia, in New South Wales and Queensland and Western Australia. Bless them. Father, for those who are joining with me now in the UK, Bless them. May we each have an experience of the grace of God, the infilling of your spirit. And Lord, as we dig a little bit deeper through this epistle to the Galatians, help us to be in a better position to love others to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you haven't yet given this a thumbs up, please do. If you haven't hit the notification bell, please do that as well. If you're not yet a subscriber, please hit subscribe. Uh, I thank all those who have recently subscribed and it's my hope that we can keep getting these videos out to help you just take a little bit of time out of your day to dig a little bit deeper through this epistle at the moment and then we'll move on to another biblical book after this. God bless you and I hope to see you in the next instalment through Paul's epistle to the Galatians as we dig a little deeper. God bless you. Thank you.